Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell, and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Binge Factor. I'm Tracy Hazard, and I have a marketing professional. She's not just any professional. She's a part of the USA Speaker Series. So I love that I can really talk to someone with a senior communications and marketing background because wanting to hear what works from the past and is continuing to work in the podcasting space and continues to work in the future, like these are really important things. So I'm excited to have Anika Jackson on. She is a senior communications and marketing professional with over 25 years experience working with diverse brands and clients of all sizes to build local and global interest and create meaningful synergistic relationships between brands and consumers. Besides her role as a graduate level professor at USC Annenberg and co-producer and co-host of the USC Mediascape speaker series and podcasts, she is VP of PR at Full Capacity Marketing. Anika also produces and hosts the Your Brand Amplified podcast and created the Brand Amplifier program for small businesses. Anika is a best-selling Amazon author in the women's anthology, Business on Purpose, Volume 2, and she's a member of the Intuit Small Business Council and serves on the advisory board for UC Santa Barbara's Women in Leadership Executive Program. She contributes her knowledge and thought leadership to benefit multiple local, national, and global nonprofits. Anika is just amazing. I had so much fun talking with her, and I know you're going to love this interview, especially because we're talking about amplifying who you are. And so we're really talking about the kind of brands that most small to mid-sized businesses are. You're not this giant brand with lots of budget. You're that one who really has to make every dollar you spend in your marketing and brand amplification, getting it to work harder for you. So let's go to Anika Jackson, your brand amplified. Anika, I'm so glad to have you here. Your brand amplified. First off, mm-hmm. I really love brand focus because I think brand gives us a broader look at everything. So if we're building a business, we're building a personal coaching, it's a brand first model. Yeah. And too few people think of it as a brand. And if you're building a big business, Your brand is the thing that usually stands at the end of the day. So we should be starting there. Exactly. And that was the impetus behind Your Brand Amplified, the name. It was originally a tagline for my PR firm, Annika PR, which is now, you know, defunct. I've moved on to other things, but I kept Your Brand Amplified because the whole concept was I was having so many clients come to me They said, I'm ready for PR. I need PR. And I would step back and go, okay, you have a logo, you have your website, you have your social media, but do you really know who your audience is? Have you built your foundation? So everything has to build from that, whether it's your personal brand, your professional brand. And that is really just a a place I love to focus. And of course, the podcast, you're not just going to get branding advice. You'll hear from different entrepreneurs about their brands and how they started their journey. Because I like to get into that, like the why, the how. What are the things that you had to struggle with that helped you build to where you are that we can all learn from? Well, and I think too many people, and and from what I can hear on your podcast, and of <laughs> course, you know, I have not, we've not worked together on a project or anything like not that yet. yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not yet. Um, but, you know, I the problem that I have had with a lot of branding experts over time is that they do forget the personal nature of branding and they it becomes over stylized, over branded, mm. overdone, and you lose the story in it. Yeah. So I'm very sure because you're a podcaster <laughs> that that personal touch has really come through. Has it changed the advice that you give on the branding side because you're trying to really create this story that is a more long tail? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I used to be a person who'd say, "Okay, I need I need to have another client right now." So sure, I'll add you as a client. And even though Maybe they didn't want to go through the process and they were just ready to start. And there's not 
the success just doesn't come as fast or as it doesn't last as long, right? When you start that way. Um, and originally when I started the podcast, I was like, I'm just going to interview publicists and PR people. And I have five questions. And I had this whole concept in my head. Then when I started doing it, it didn't feel right. It's like, this isn't really authentic. It's not authentic to who I am and how I like to learn from other people and how I like to have these conversations and build connection. So then I knew it wasn't going to be, you know, authentic for my audience either. And since I've changed it to really dig in, the audience has grown. I get a lot more, you know, brand recognition <laughs> for my for my podcast, but also for working as a brand strategist. And I think the guests also really appreciate it. I have so many guests who come on and say, oh, I thought we, you know, most podcasts only want to talk about this one subject that I say I'm the expert in. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, we're going to cover that, but let's dig deeper. Let's find out more because why does somebody want to work with you? Any, there are 20 million companies that can do what you do, that deliver these results or say they do, but why you? What's your differentiator? Uh, and I've also realized that in the course of work, you have to be authentic to your own values and your own brand, because if you're working at a company you don't feel in tune with, you're not going to do as good a job. You're probably going to quit or get fired. <laughs> like all, a lot of things are going to happen that are not necessarily positives. And so if we can figure out who we are and work from that and really stay in tune with our authenticity and our brand, then life is so much richer and so many more things open up. You're using that broad definition of brand, of which I'm so glad, right? Because <laughs> so many people are like, oh, brand, it's your logo and it's your, yeah. you know, it's what you say you are. Like, it's just, it's your tagline. And you're using that broad definition of brand to include the way you show up for everything, right? Yeah. The integrity <laughs> that you you provide. And that's why a podcast does have a brand, yes. right? It, it yeah. is a brand <laughs> in motion. It's working. I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm so glad you use that full, full fledged definition of brand because it's so necessary nowadays. But the other part that I think that you're just emphasizing here is that it's not set in stone. Like it's, mm -hmm. and that's where I think people think, oh, I spent all this money creating a logo. I cre spent all this money doing this. Right. So it's, it's locked in and they don't think, wow, this isn't working for me. Maybe I should change it a little bit. And so I used to get my clients to consider because I would design products, right? Without the brand and the product together, like it didn't work. <laughs> so we had to start somewhere. And so when they wouldn't commit to the brand, I couldn't design mm. the product because I didn't know who it was for. So I said, let's have a hypothesis brand. And that's what I would mm. call it. And so I would say, yes. here's your hypothesis brand. This is what we think our audience is going to be. And mm -hmm. we do this with the podcast. We think our <laughs> listeners are going to be PR firms and they're not, right? <laughs> we think our listeners are going to be like, my very first one was the podcast was in 3D printing. And it was like, I think we we're going to have 14 year old boys in the garage, you know, geeky. <laughs> yeah. No, they turned out to be retirees oh in the gosh. Midwest, right? <laughs> like, you know, totally wrong model. But we thought that and then we proved it. And that's the hypothesis part, right? We proved that it was wrong. And then we yes. shift the brand. Exactly. It's it's an evolving process. And I always say your purpose might remain the same, right? I feel like everything I've done in my life has been connected to the same purpose, but the mechanism for presenting it has changed. Mm -hmm. So I'm still who I am as a, as a brand, right? Or as a person. But when I lived in Houston, I was more involved in philanthropy and I had a radio show that was on Facebook Live instead of a podcast, right? And I did a lot more of that kind of work and like fashion and getting people to donate money to charities. When I moved back to LA, I shifted into podcasting and really focusing on the work and teaching and small businesses and a whole different side, but I was still trying to do the same thing, still trying to propel positive messages out into the world just for a different audience. And so I had to shift, what is my message to these people? And are, are these the right people that I'm working with? And this is something I come across a lot of times, like people can be in business for 20 years and realize that the messaging they're putting out there is not corresponding to the people they want to reach now. Might have been 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even a year ago, but you have to evolve. I think that so many people look at their podcast as straight marketing. Mm. They look at it as a brand extension. What do you think the differences are between that? Oh, gosh, so many, so many. I, I love that you brought this up because there are people who say, use your podcast as a business funnel, only have your ideal client on as a guest, and then you can upsell them. Fantastic. But 
that's, that's what you're talking about with like, it's a sales funnel, right? It's a marketing tool, but are you really there serving people? Because the best ways to have relationships are to figure out how you're adding value to somebody else. And then hopefully you can have a deeper relationship and then you want to do business together, right? You're not just taking from them because I think if you have, and I do know people, so forgive me if anybody's listening to this, I do and have experience being on podcasts where people are there to upsell you and really funnel you into their program. Um, and I, I've said no to those offers, those kind offers, but uh, when I've been a guest, but uh, you know, it, you have to get to know people. And that has been the beauty of this for me is I, I have this whole network. I think you were saying before we got on, I'm about 266 episodes as of recording this, by the time this comes out, I don't even, it'll be closer to 300 possibly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause you're doing one a day. So yeah, or five a week, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. You should be closer. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I, those are, and not everybody is going to be somebody I connect with, but so many of them are now people that we call on each other. We check in, we refer business to each other. We're figuring out how we can make each other's lives better. And that is where I find that's the brand, right? That's right. where you're really forming relationships. You're being authentic to, because I, I learned something new. I've been in branding and marketing for over two decades. And I still learn something new when I talk to my guests. And it might be a shift in life perspective. It could be a business tool. I don't know, but that's also beautiful. And I know that that's, if I'm learning something new, I know that my guests, wherever they are in their journeys are also doing the same. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's, I like, you know, I just heard this term the other day and I was thinking, oh, this fits you. You're a collector. And <laughs> those of us who are really good collectors are also really good distributors, right? Yes. Really good at saying, oh, you're the perfect person to talk to this person. And then magic happens. And being that catalyst, I think, is something that energizes you. Oh, so much. So much so. It's just seeing that moment. I just had a call before, right before this interview, actually, with three women um, two found out they live in the same city now, which was crazy because one had just moved from Medellin, Colombia. And one is helping women uh, with their platform, which is related to podcasting, um, that they help find pe get people onto the right podcast. But they're building up this women's initiative throughout South America to provide great jobs for women and train them on their system so they can do done-for-you services. I have a nonprofit that works in Ghana. Another woman on the call works in Kenya and Tanzania. Another woman on the call is, is Egyptian American. So we're like, how can we take, when you get your model and your system down, how can we train women or teens or other people in these other countries to do this work using the beauty of AI and being English speaking and all the things that you, they need to have, but to provide better outcomes for them. And so that's, and then there were all these other tangents we went off because that's what happens well, when you put I'm women getting, together, right? I'm getting goosebumps, Sonica, because I can't wait to tell you what I've got that would add to that. Like, oh my like gosh. that's the beauty of really having this synergistic model of it instead of the funnel model. It yes. gets too forced. And this synergistic model has a flow to it that just makes it fun. And makes me want to have a call now with all of us and figure this all out. And Let's how can do we help it. Let's each do other? it. What can we do? Right. <laughs> That's a real beauty of it. And I, you know, I think it's really interesting that you, you know, you started in the publicity world because I think publicity two decades ago, for sure, when you started and <laughs> three decades ago, when I started <laughs> a little longer than that, but when it was much more transactional. Mm, yeah. And that's not how publicity works today. No. Not at no. all. Yeah. If you and don't I, feel like you found it as a writer or, I mean, cause I, I wrote a column for Inc. Magazine yeah. for 400, ep 400 yeah. articles worth. Oh my gosh. Right? So yeah. And so like, if I didn't, if I felt like somebody was pushing someone on me, it would never work. It just mm -hmm. felt, it. You, you had to have a relationship that you really built up over time. And I think the Buzz publicist discovered that. And as the world shifted out of this, like you submit a press release and then somebody will pick it up, right? Like it's just not <laughs> that way anymore. No. And, and I started out as a club promoter and promoting DJs and clubs and totally different type of marketing and, and publicity work. And then I, that was in Kansas and Kansas city. And then Chicago, I worked for KVA marketing, doing nightlife promotions and Audi promotions. And this was way before computers when <laughs> I had have to call people on the phone or go to a bar to get them to drink Smirnoff or whatever, you know, or whatever we were branding. And I was a club promoter there. And then 
I didn't get into the PR side until after I'd moved to LA to work for magazines, then moved to uh, San Francisco to launch magazines in the marketing side and was working with publicists. And I was like, oh, I, I do this. I just do it in a different way, but I want to add that to my toolbox of skills. But those were the days of faxing a press release, calling the newsroom, get it, you know, is there, is anybody going to take my call? <laughs> like, uh, so different than today where you can just push a button and it gets distributed, but it, because of that, it has less value. Yes. And it drives me crazy when people take that. We could go on so many tangents about that. <laughs> but when, when people are like, look at where my press release was, they did an article about me. I'm like, no, that's completely different. You have to build relationships. And journalists sometimes will hold on to those pitches for six months until, wow. be, until they know, okay, they like the pitch, but I don't have space for it. Oh, now I do. It's a right. very different world. It's the right time in the world for me to pull this one out, right? Like that's yeah. a that's a gift. So where in that process did podcasting come in for you and you because you seem to be like right on the edge of all the technology shifts, which <laughs> I've been as well. So I, I can see that path through everything that you've done. When did podcasting come into your view and you said, This is something I want to go for? When I moved from Houston to LA. I kind of started out over with my career. I left a business in Houston. And then of course the pandemic closed that down. And it was really hard to do the show on Facebook and digital radio. You it know, wasn't the same with everywhere. radio. Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't the same as being in the same room. And um, one thing that we did was we had different sets for different vignettes of the Facebook part of the show. It was really fun. Um, and I actually had clients who knew me from then and asked me to post a podcast for their brand. And then I realized it wasn't really sustainable. I had two different podcasts for two different clients. They didn't really have budgets, loved them both dearly still to this day, but I wasn't paying myself anything. I was doing all the work and I was just paying my team to edit them. And my boyfriend is in the film industry and he does editing like that's his bread and butter, although he does all the other things too. He's like, why don't you just have your own podcast? You know how to do this. You love speaking to people. I can start you out with the editing process until you, you know, get on your way and hire somebody else. And I was like, oh yeah, why don't I do that? And that was where it started. And it wasn't consistent at all. This is in 2020 when I started my own podcast. Just no consistency. I just kind of did it, try to fit it in with my business and everything else. And then maybe a, a year later, I was like, I, I see how big this is getting. Podcasting now, it's, I mean, it's 20 something years old, 21 years old to this year, 2024. Something like that. Yep. <laughs> but it, it had been around, but more people were getting attuned to it. And I was like, I love these conversations I'm having. And this, I'm, we're all stuck at home. This is a great way to meet people and talk to more people and expand my network. So really it was just more of that and like just getting to know people and learn this world and then I started taking it more seriously. And now I have a wait list. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't remember even, I think I scheduled this months ago with you. Like <laughs> now it's in this world of like where I was nominated for a podcast awards. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I'm speaking at a conference, podcast um, evolutions, the podcast movement evolutions. And I just love this world and I love the people in it. And I feel like most of us are there to help support each other and celebrate each other's wins, not, you know, collaboration over competition, as some people say. Um, and so it's just something I've just fallen in love with. And that fits your collector collaboration yes. kind of model, right? It totally <laughs> yeah, does. Exactly. You know, and I think about this is I, I think that many, many people in the role of branding publicity, that's, I think, the frustrating part when we come into a company and we see the connections they're not making. Mm -hmm. And because they have too much of a sales focus or they have too much of a product focus, a tech focus, right? Yes. And they aren't seeing this connection, relationship, building the things that could really expand them. And so you're working to try to provide that. And you do a lot of that discussion on your show with your the way that you interview. What is What are you always looking for in that conversation that you really are trying to draw out? I'm really looking for, I don't know if this, this might sound a little like woo-woo, but the essence of a person, right? Um, because we all start businesses and we all have ups and downs, but I want to know what really drives them. 
And why do they stay in this? And why are they so passionate about what they do and what they're putting into the world? And that is where the magic happens. That's where I get good advice. There are a lot of, there are frankly guests who come on and just want to talk about one thing and that's it. And I try and it's a little harder. And sometimes it's not always success. To me, it's not always successful to the listener. They might love the episode, <laughs> but um, but I that's what I'm looking for is that making that connection, really learning who they are as a brand and why what their why is. Because then that's a person that's my person. And that's somebody I want to refer people to. And that's somebody I'll remember. And I'll say, hey, we haven't spoken for six months, but let's get on a call. What are you doing now? How can I help support your business? What, you know, what do you need from me? And what do you want to give me in return if they offer that? And sometimes it takes a long time to figure out what that is, yeah. right? It can take a year, a year and a half sometimes, but just keeping that connection and knowing that's a good person. I really like what they shared. They have, they're so in tune with what they have to offer the world. Cause I think we all have something unique. So yeah. that's what, really what I'm trying to pull out. Cause that's what I think is the, your essence is your brand. Well, that's what I was thinking as you were saying that is like goes back to what you said earlier is that, you know, you're always trying to find out where that real uniqueness is. Where is it that you're different from all the other companies that offer that yeah. same thing <laughs> out there? Where is it that, you know, what is the essence of makes you you is the same thing that makes your brand you, right? Like that makes that brand yep. special, right? So if you can tell that story makes it easier publicity. It makes it easier articles. It makes it easier to market. I think when you get to that, but so few people want to go into that. Like they just like, oh no, no, no. Here's my, my benefit list. <laughs> like here's why you should buy. <laughs> yeah. And that's where like on certain systems that I have profiles on, I say in big letters, I like to go deep. <laughs> and that's why I really want people to listen because Sometimes I do, I still get bad pitches where people are like, oh, I saw you on this and I think I should be on your podcast. I'm like, you didn't tell me why. You didn't tell me what resonates with you about the way I interviewed. Like, give me more, please. And so now I have a wait list that people can go on. And that way I can really look through their information and decide, okay, is this somebody for now? Is this somebody for maybe later when I have an open space to fill? Yeah. So, yeah, because I, because I do like to, hear people and give give them an opportunity but not everybody's right for every podcast either yeah you know I was just thinking about like you know a lot of publicists used to offer media training and other things like that and I think oh. the ones who are media trained are the worst <laughs> like I never want to have them be a guest oh, no. on my show right? because they that that it's not the same podcasting isn't the same and if they feel it they need that significant amount of training don't get me wrong we want people to be professional. Yeah, like there's yes. some amount of like, get a good microphone, be able to like, you know, tell a good story. But I do not want you to give me sound bites. It doesn't work here right. like it does on TV or a radio. It's just not the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so interesting. Well, let you've done a lot of work with big brands, but you've also done work with and in your heart it was with small businesses and, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs. I find that they take a lot of bad advice. Mm. They spend too much money in the scope of, it's not too much money for a brand, but it's too much money in the scope of what they do, usually too early on things. What, what is it that could shift them out of that? What do you think that they mm. should do different? Well, and I will say as, you know, having had different businesses in my lifetime, I have made a lot of those mistakes as well. Uh, and I think the most important thing is I was actually having this call with somebody yesterday who's starting a podcast and they're good girlfriends of mine. And they said, well, here's a proposal that we got from somebody. And I was like, you don't need to spend, you know, $10,000 between these four areas to start your podcast. I oh, teach grad don't. school. Yeah. I teach <laughs> grad school at USC. I have an, I have amazing students. Let me introduce you to one of my students who can help you. They've been through my branding process in class. They can help you create your brand, your logo, your colors, but take you through your purpose, vision, mission, value, statement, positioning, personas, and your social media. Just do that. I, I told them, just make sure you have good equipment. That's, and just start. 
That's what you and need that to doesn't have on. to cost too much. Yes, exactly, a hundred dollar microphone, to... nothing. Like, do not overspend. Hundred percent. And I think that's where so many people get it wrong. They think they have to spend a lot of money on a flashy website, um, you know, on all their social media stuff. But just start small. Start somewhere. Start where your audience is actually going to live. Just have a landing page. Have a simple landing page. You don't. You can do it yourself, or you can find somebody really inexpensively. And I think. People build things and they're like, okay, I built it. Now everybody's going to start coming. It's like, well, no, now you have to nurture your audience, whether it's getting on podcasts or whether it's, you know, and doing some paid advertising and doing some organic social and doing some other earned media besides pot. Like you have to do a little bit of the peso mix um, <laughs> so that you're hitting all of the places where your audience is going to find you. So invest in that, invest in the learning. Don't invest in the big team. Don't invest in the the awesome bells and whistles and spending a lot of money on a launch party because it ultimately that's, it's not what's needed. I, I liken it to like when I lived in Houston, I had to make sure my hair and makeup were done and wear different clothes and go to all these events. And I had a social club and we did a lot of business stuff for the members in the social club and a lot of marketing. We had a retail store attached to it, but you had to get out so that people realized you existed. Then I moved back to LA. I'm like, wait, I can just sit <laughs> at home in Redondo Beach in my sweats and just do the work. And people will appreciate that I know how to do the work and I don't have to do that other stuff. Don't get me wrong. That stuff is great. But I much prefer just to be able to sit here and have conversations and do the work. And it feels so much more authentic to me. And it's not all those bells and whistles that I had to deal with before, but it's a lot more satisfying. And I'm reaching the right people now and the, the people who are those small businesses and you know people I can really help. Yeah, you know, I I always think back to like the very first website that we built probably cost us like fifty thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! And, you know, now if you spend five, I think you're spending too much. Like it's like you know, or you're you're you know, it, you better be ready to build a website at that point, right? Like you, yeah. know, you better have be uh, ready to add a store to it and make make sure you've got sales <laughs> for it if you're going to spend five thousand, right? Like it's just so it's so much easier actually, but in, in the easier of being able to do it and more cost effective. There's also too much noise, too it's, many choices. What are some ways that you filter through that and decide what's of value and what's not for yourself and for your clients? I listen to experts. Uh, I was I interviewed a foremost AI expert for my podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, Manuj Agarwal. He is based in Vancouver. I know him. I've had him on my has, show. <laughs> he's amazing. He has four patents. And the way he talked about AI shifted my perspective as, but it also, he said, small businesses need to have three tools, chat GPT, um, mid journey and the Google suite. And if you just start there, so simplify, use the ones that are known quantities. Now I have other ideas for AI tools that kind of combine all yeah, those. Yeah. I was going to say, with, if you're a podcaster, but, those would not be my three choices, but well, yeah, I've been yeah. working in AI yeah. since 2018. <laughs> so like I have a little more in depth than that, but you yeah. Do. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a podcaster, that's, I'm not saying for podcasters, but if you're just right. starting a small business and you need to figure some things out, I come, you know, reach out to one of us because we have some other recommendations we'll make for you too. Yeah. That will be even simpler than having to use all three of those. But yeah. So just use, just figure out like, what are the most simple systems that I can use? I have also fallen to like, I need to buy this program and that program. We all do that because we think somebody else has the answer, but has they been able to repeat their success? multiple times in different industries That's and modalities. The part. Yes. This is the part I want to see repeated success. And yes. <laughs> when you can't do that, that is not a program I'm ready to dive into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So important. Well, advice for podcasters, mm -hmm. what takeaways have you done? I mean, almost 300 episodes. I mean, <laughs> amazing. And so, I mean, I don't know if you realize this, but you're hitting into the, you're about to hit into the 3%. So you're getting close Ooh. to the 2%, but you're at the 3% right now. <laughs> so less than 3% of podcasters ever hit 300 episodes. Wow. That's a big deal. You should be really proud of that, progress, especially in such a short time. And it's because you're doing so many episodes <laughs> a week right now. That's helping you, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, crash coursing it. But what have you learned over this time that is great advice for mm. someone just starting out? Well, first of all, just start. Don't, if you have an idea and you want to get to start, just practice. You get better. You get so much better over time. 
And now even the way I've seen the progression and the shift from those first few episodes to, okay, I'm going to do one a week and take it really more seriously to, wow, I have so many episodes that I want to get out because I don't want these people to be waiting six months for their episode to come out. So starting to do more and more a week. And then, you know, and the way I interview has changed and it's morphed and you will continue to get better and better. The more you practice, the more you figure out what, what is your je ne sais quoi when you're as a host. Uh, I love using simple systems that will help make sure that my podcast is everywhere, that will help create all the AI stuff for me and make recommendations for my show notes. And they're not costly. So I think there are a lot. And again, I love a lot of people who do this and I work with a lot of them, but there are a lot of ways that you can reduce the costs of starting your podcast as well and not go out and hire a huge production company, you know, right off the bat, like just start, just start and 70 something percent of podcasters use zoom just use zoom you that's know, my recommendation say, too yeah <laughs> but <laughs> like, it's not just, because just... it's not because podcasters start there it's because your guests <laughs> if you want to get really good guests oh. they're so comfortable on zoom nowadays it's just easy yeah it's easy and there are ways there are techniques there are things that we do behind the scenes like separating the audio and making sure we're you know recording in higher def video and all those things that we do on our side to make sure that it looks really great for you as the guest so, um, yeah, I, I mean, just, just start, just put your list together. I love a good Google form so that I have all the information for my guests. And I know you have great forms. And um, I think that's the biggest thing is I think people get scared of just starting and, and they get scared. They get that imposter syndrome that what they have to offer is invaluable, but everybody has something to offer. And there is somebody who wants to listen to your podcast right now to get that information and they don't have it because you're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so true. Well, what's next for you? What's next for your brand Amplify? So, so many things. Well, I've just started another podcast for USC Annenberg for the digital media management master's program that I teach in. It's called Mediascape Insights from Digital Changemakers. Very, very excited about that. And we have a lot of great guests lined up and coming out now that we've converted it to a podcast from a speaker series. And then for your brand Amplified, I keep being called like the outsourced co-founder by a lot of people. So I'm teeing up, I mean, it's talking about like what we've been talking about, collecting people and distributing. So I'm creating a resource through your band Amplified to help small businesses and entrepreneurs find the right resources, people who are not going to be crazy expensive, but are really great at what they do. And I'll have a lot of those resources on my site by the time this comes out. Uh, so you just get, go to yourbrandamplified.com and you can find it. I also do... Uh, monthly free webinars on branding. And then if you want more, then we can work together in coaching or I have an online program that ties into that. Everything's on yourbrandamplified.com. And those seminars work through what is it to, what's your brand blueprint? And then a little extra information that I do some case studies to show how we helped, you know, elevate people's brands. So wonderful. Well, I'm so glad you are out there, Anika. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing your brand oh, amplified <laughs> and your perspective on brand and growth into the entrepreneurship and small business space. Thank you for having me, Tracy. I told you that was going to be really insightful. She just has such great view of what it really takes to make your brand be seen. And that is so hard, especially when you're on a limited budget. It's really hard to make it work well for you. And lots of the prevailing advice out there, especially from marketing professionals, and you would have thought a USC professor, she's talking to big brands, but she's not. She's really talking at a level at which most of your clients, if you were her students, are going to have to deal with, and most of us are dealing with. Like, how do we really grow into that brand, big brand status? Well, there's a lot of path along the way. So I loved your brand Amplified. It's a great podcast, a great show with lots of resources. She has really focused on the things that are worthwhile. And when she asks questions of her guests, and when she's giving advice on the show, she's cognizant of the fact that you might spend too much on bad advice. So she's very careful about what she's curating for you. That's why I know you're going to love the show. It's definitely worth every podcaster out there. So if you're a podcast host already or you're thinking of starting one, go listen to Anika Jackson's Your Brand Amplified because it is a very worthwhile show for you personally. I know it was for me. 
I love when I can bring more of these type of podcasters where they're really giving, you're going to get as much out of their podcast, not just from their example and their story, but you're going to get as much out of their show and subscribing to their show as you are for subscribing to mine. So, and for me, giving you an insight into them. So I'm so glad I could bring you that. Anika Jackson, Your Brand Amplified, fantastic podcast host, fantastic advice on our show. Go listen. Thanks everyone for listening here to The Binge Factor. And I'll be back next week with yet another great podcaster here on The Binge Factor. 